Amphibia is a show with extreme emotional depth. It's a story that makes you laugh, cry and wonder. And also one that makes you feel like there's always something new to explore. Always a way to get to know the characters even better. In an attempt to deliver on that point, I've made this video, diving as deep as possible into all the great things there are to learn about Amphibia. Follow me as we are analyzing the entirety of the Amphibia iceberg. On level 1, we'll be dealing with some rather obvious stuff, ranging from general info about the show to some canon fun facts. So let's go through this quickly. Hapup is voiced by Bill Farmer, otherwise best known for his role as Goofy. Anne's voice belongs to Brenda Song, which is very suiting given Brenda has a Thai background too. Show creator Matt Brawley also took on various roles, and further gave the role of Miss Boon Choi to his own mother, on Brawley, because the team could not find a voice actress with a native Thai accent. Leaf the Frog was actually a planter and would later be known in the family records as Lily Planter. Her and Andreas's toad friend was called Barrel, revealing that Barrel's Warhammer in fact belonged to him. By the end of the show, Olivia and Yunan are a couple, meaning they are both queer. Wilbur's adoptive daughter, Emma the Newt, is the same as Anne, having been a traveler of another species that wound up in Wartwood and then just stayed with the planters. Not to mention that they have the same hair. The Owl House season to finale King's Tide alluded to the ending of Amphibia, claiming the story of the girl in a frog world and the invasion of Earth might have all been a hoax. This easter egg also implies that the two shows are set in the same universe, though this has neither been confirmed nor is it actually canon to Amphibia. Nice. On level 2, we've got more, lesser known facts for the real Amphibia fans among you. Throughout the entire show, there are secret messages hidden all over the place that you can decipher yourself if you want, given the ancient amphibian alphabet can be looked up on the internet. The story of Amphibia is inspired by Matt's personal experiences of visiting Thailand when he was younger. Every time they visited family over there, as someone who grew up in the US, he used to feel completely out of place at first. Over time, he slowly came to love the country and culture, learning to fit in, before eventually having to go back home again, despite feeling at home there too. While we are already talking about Matt's family, Anne's design stems from a childhood photo of Matt's grandmother. Spot on. On top of that, Anne's personality is what Matt always imagined his grandma was like as a kid. Seems to me like he had the coolest grandma ever. In contrast, Sasha's character originated from Matt's painful experiences. She is based off of a former friend whose unpleasant sides gave birth to Sasha's initial personality. That contrast between Anne and Sasha's origins is furthermore perfectly summed up by their relationship being being heavily inspired by the dynamics between Berserk's guts and Griffith. Though I must say, I am more than glad that Sasha is not nearly as evil as Griffith. We are now reaching the third level of the iceberg, where things start to get interesting. Because starting now, we are addressing implications, direct ones at first. All the things that have not been spelled out literally in the show, but have been portrayed in such a way that the viewer should know what's up. For now, we'll stay with Sasha for a bit. Ten years after the end of Amphibia, Sasha picks up Marcy with her car, where she keeps a tiny bisexual flag, suggesting that Sasha is bisexual herself, just like her voice actress Anna Ekana is. Some people also speculated that Marcy is queer too, based on some behavior towards Anne, and at times all three of them have been shipped together in a triangle. Although there have never been any real indications or official nods, at romantic feelings having ever existed between any of them. Sasha furthermore revealed that she is currently working as a kind of therapist for children. Her career choice originated from her experiences in Amphibia, as she wants to help children deal with trauma and emotions in general, to prevent them from turning out like her. A freaking maniac. Admittedly, we can expect her to be quite good at her job, not only because she learned firsthand how to approach these issues, also because she's a natural manipulating talent, which can basically 
basically be used for therapizing people. Is it morally questionable? Yes. But I mean, whatever works, works, right? So that's great. What's not so great is the fact that if Anne, Marcy and Sasha had not come to Amphibia, they would not have stayed friends or even in contact until now. Marcy would have moved away and Sasha explained that even with their friendship issues having been fixed, her and Anne drifted apart in high school. So the main reason for them getting together every year for Anne's birthday is because they made it a tradition in memory of their time in Amphibia. And obviously, had they not gone there, their relationship would not have changed for the good in the slightest. Although not being the show's message, in a way, Marcy actually did reach her goal of ensuring they'd stay forever together. Well, at the same time in Amphibia, a new continent has been discovered. The funny thing is, Harpap once implied that the world of Amphibia could actually be flat. Considering we have never seen any sign of another continent on the side that Amphibia's on, the new continent appears to be located on the other side of the disc. Thus, traveling to the new continent literally means crossing the boundaries of the planet. And talking about planets, remember how Amphibia's moon had in reality been built by the core and was covered with its eyes? Yeah, that's why the moon's been orange all this time. And while they were not creating new ones, the core and Andrea's ancestors were usually invading other planets. Considering what happened in Amphibia, we have quite the good image of what went down in all the other worlds back then. Stealing resources, crushing any kind of resistance, and all in all, completely annihilating the worlds as they were. The gruesome implication is that as a consequence, most life of the respective worlds has likely been wiped out. How would they survive in a world without any resources left? So firstly, the girls got lucky that they got transported to Amphibia, where they could at least live normally. And secondly, even if there had been the chance to explore a couple other worlds throughout the show, a majority of them would have probably been nothing but wasteland. Fortunately, Anne managed to prevent the invasion of Earth, thereby saving humanity from the same fate. Her heroic deeds were live cast on national TV. I guess her parents' restaurant must have been trending afterwards. In this case, and again when confronting the moon, on one hand, the calamity powers saved the day. On the other hand, the powers are in fact what took Anne's life. This is the reason she stated in the new normal that using the powers felt bad. She was predestined to be killed by those exact powers. No wonder it felt weird. Assumably, this feeling was a kind of premonition caused by the gems being connected to the Guardian, who can see the future. The Guardian predicted that Anne would take on their role in another 78 years, meaning that Anne's copy will die at some point around 2097 or 98, being roughly 91 years old. Speaking of old people, right now Harpap and Sylvia are a couple, but Sylvia is not Sprig and Polly's grandmother. Their grandmother was never in any way addressed in the show, suggesting that she is not around in Wartwood. The possibilities are that HP either had a child outside of marriage and the child or children were left with him, they did marry but divorced, or unfortunately he became a widow. Oh and let's not forget the final option, Harpa murdered his wife. Listen, listen, he never denied Briggs inquiry whether he had ever killed someone, he knows an assassin in town, and Kai Kinda killed that one guy in the source factory. The H in Harpap stands for homicide. Apart from that, due to the relationship between HP and Sylvia, Sprig and Ivy are related in name. So while they are not related by blood, they are still officially cousins, dating each other. Seriously, I, I can't with this family anymore. First murder and now incest. Alright, let's leave this behind us and move on to more meaningful relations. For example, the relation between the gemstones and the girls. Evidently, the values the gems represent are in accordance with the girls' personalities respectively. But did you know that the gems' colors' meanings also resonate with the girls? Blue stands for freedom and inspiration, suiting Anne, the only one with a free heart that keeps inspiring others throughout the show. Green symbolizes new beginnings and growth, literally Marcy's entire story. 
red expresses many different emotions, such as courage, passion and aggression. Not only do these perfectly describe Sasha, they also sum up her contrasting personality, her flawed execution of partly good intentions. Conversely, there are others whose intentions were not good, like these three here. They eagerly supported Andreas through his entire Nazi trip, which is why they deserve to receive the same punishment as him, and are seen helping him plant trees 10 years later. I hope that so far nothing I mentioned came to you as too big of a surprise, because we are just now descending to the fourth level of the iceberg, where the matters at hand are indirect implications, meaning we are totally reading between the lines here. We are still more or less sticking to the source material, but get a little creative in interpreting them. In the same 10 years later scene we just dealt with, if you take a real close look, you'll notice that Andrea's eyes are a different color than before, giving off the impression that he is blind. How could he have gone completely blind in a matter of just 10 years? Well, he's lived way past his time already, which was only possible through continuously turning his body into machinery and fixing said machinery whenever necessary. Following his defeat and change of heart, he wanted to leave his evil past behind, thus also refusing any more treatment of his body, given it is a reminder of his evil ways. In short, time is finally catching up with him. Over the course of the past 10 years, the marks of the prior 1000 years have come to the surface, also foreshadowing that Andreas will be dead soon. Just like Anne. Yep, Anne is dead. She has indeed not been revived. The Guardian clearly stated they made a copy of Anne's memories before she lost her life. Anne's body of today is an artificial, recreated version of her original one, infused with the copied memories. This is an extremely difficult topic, and there is certainly no definite answer to the question whether a perfect copy is equal to the original. On one hand, in the grand scheme of things, Anne has returned and lived happily ever after, because her copy is literally indistinguishable from the real Anne, at least based on what we've seen so far. On the other hand, the copy is factually not the same individual as Anne, and there is no arguing that. This fact alone is firstly reason enough to suspect the copy could even, in the slightest possible ways, differ from the real Anne, thus behave differently. Secondly, forces us to accept that the Anne we've known and loved has died and will stay dead. So in a sense, instead of being revived, one might say Anne was reborn that day. Instead of the same Anne having come back to life, a new version of Anne first saw the light of day. For that reason, it is Anne's birthday exactly 10 years after the course defeat, despite it not having been mentioned that it was Anne's 14th birthday 10 years ago. But since Anne was reborn that day, everyone started treating that day as her new birthday. Now, since we are already discussing Anne's birthday. Back then she was having a great day, until things started taking a turn for the worse when Sasha pulled off her usual being dominant show. We never really got to know how Sasha ended up being the person she was initially, did we? However, there is a large consensus in the fandom regarding the theory that it had something to do with her parents. In the Christmas episode it was revealed that Sasha's parents are divorced, and from that point on people have been fixated on the idea that their separation changed changed Sasha permanently. In a way, Sasha may have had separation anxiety similar to Marcy. Conceivably, dominating Anne and Marcy and controlling them may have been her own subconscious way of securing they would stay together. Maybe the feeling of being powerless when her parents divorced drove her into being obsessed with having power over others. Not out of a true desire to rule over others, but out of the wish to do better than last time, being able to avoid another separation of those dear to her. Even if that truly was the case, that could still not justify the majority of her actions in Amphibia, including how she treated Percy and Braddock, who wholeheartedly wished to stay with Sasha and to be her friends. Consequently, their absence from the final episodes is actually an amazing detail. Many people had theorized they'd show up again to showcase Sasha's development, and then when they did not return, people were wondering if maybe they had been forgotten. No one knows the true reason, but interpreting their absence as intended suggests that there is a meaning behind it. Even if people change for the better, mistakes cannot be undone, and not any damage done can be repaired. Sasha 
had truly, utterly ruined their friendship, up to the point when Braddock and Percy could not bring it over themselves to join Sasha's rebellion. She did develop a lot, and I'm proud of her for that. But let's be honest here, one of the major reasons why she was forgiven by anyone is because she's a cartoon character. In spite of any development she's gone through, Sasha is kind of a psychopath. Not because of her dominance or selfishness issues, just because she's canonically prepared to kill other sentient beings, especially humans, without hesitation. <sighs> I guess that's part of the reason why she was chosen by the Red Gemstone. Definitely the worst fit for the Blue Heartstone out of the trio in my opinion. Really makes you wonder though, how this whole relation between the gems and the respective character traits really worked and how much it influenced the story. For example, Anne's powers, the powers of the Heartstone, awoke whenever her heart was broken. The first time when the planter farm she loved dearly and wanted to protect was destroyed. And the second time when her best friend appeared to die. See, there's a connection here between the trait of the gem and the times when it's activated. An inverse relation to be precise. What implies that the other gems activate in different situations than the blue gem that resonate with their respective trait. For instance, Sasha's powers partly awoke when she was trying to rip Beryl's warhammer out of the worm's head. But just couldn't pull it off. Again, an inverse relation. The strength power activates when its bearer feels weak. Regarding Marcy, we can't exactly pinpoint a situation when the powers first awoke. Because when her powers were revealed in the show, saving Sprig, it seemed like it had not been the first time, given her confidence in her newly gained abilities. According to the deduced rule, however, her powers likely awakened in a situation when she was faced with a question, problem or riddle she felt she was not smart enough to solve. There are still a few more things to say about the gems, but for that, we're moving right along to the fifth and second to last iceberg level of free interpretation. The ideas we're picking up on this level are based on extremely slight indications provided in the show and on a huge chunk of creativity. Like I said before, no one knows precisely what the deal with the gems and their characteristics is, and how this connection even came into existence in the Amphibia universe. But even if that mystery may never be solved, people at least had a few ideas regarding what the meaning behind the character traits is. Basically, a good heart, wit and strength is what makes a hero, or maybe even just a good human. Correspondingly, the core could only be brought down by the combination of all three powers. The ultimate evil must be met with the almost stereotypical image of the ultimate good. Simultaneously, this relation demonstrates how in real life humans are dependent on one another. Usually, not everyone has access to a secret spell giving them the other powers and character traits they are lacking. Or maybe that's just me and I don't know that's normal. Anyhow, not everyone is strong, super smart or has the kindest and bravest heart, which is definitely totally normal and human. And thus, for humanity as a whole to become good, to face any challenge, people with varying strong suits must support each other to, as a whole, be strong, smart and emotionally mature at the same time. Apart from the characteristics, throughout Amphibia, the girl gem color code has also often been made use of up to the show's final frame. Here you see three cups, each holding a differently colored fluid. My my, how convenient! There's a blue, a green and a red drink. Color me surprised? Yeah, there's no way that's a coincidence. Evidently, the cups represent the girls. Peep how the distance between the Kermit colored cup and the Cookie Monster cup is slightly further Further than the distance between Cookie Monster and Elmo, a reference to Marcy moving states. Cookie Monster Cup is only halfway filled, similar to Anne carrying half a calamity power for some time. And then there's ice cubes in every cup, respectively illustrating the girl's closest relationships in Amphibia. Anne found three people she now proudly calls family. Three ice cubes floating at the top. Sasha is still close with Grime, in contrast to her relationship with Braddock and Percy that could not be fixed, represented by the sunken cubes. In the same manner, Marcy gained Olivia and Yunnan as friends. 
hands while she lost the friendship with Andreas. There are two more interpretations we can make concerning Marcy. To start, have you ever asked yourself why Marcy really ended up becoming the core? Because she was the human in Utopia? Nah, the core had enough time to find someone who's suiting and had no reason whatsoever to specifically pick a human. Because she is smart and beat Andreas in chess? No, if this was only about intelligence, in a thousand years there have surely been people before that were smarter than Andreas. I mean, yeah, both of these were requirements for Marcy to get in a position to become the core, but what ultimately convinced the core to settle on Marcy was her backstory. Her wish to create a fantasy world, where she could happily live with her friends for all eternity rendered her outstandingly susceptible to the core's manipulation. In addition to her being smart, assimilating her into the core appeared feasible without much effort. On top of that, giving that role to Marcy was done to deliver on her character and her flaws. She wanted a perfect fantasy world, and she got literally that, by giving her exactly what she yearned for, something she believed basically impossible to attain. She was tested. The only suitable remedy for her distorted view of the world was driving her into willingly giving up her picture-perfect fantasy to return to the real, flawed world. Even before the end of season 2, from when on her motivations were unveiled, there have been several hints that Marcy had not always had it easy. I'm not going to name all the obvious instances here. Instead, there's one particular behavior of Marcy's, whose meaning people are still arguing over to this day. She's blushing whenever she's complimented. Per se, that's not even noteworthy. Knowing her whole backstory, however, certainly gives the impression that she's not at all used to being complimented. Further taking into account how she never expected people to like her webcomic, wholeheartedly supporting her work, painfully reminds us of the fact that she was almost traumatized by her friends, and likely also her family, not having been cherished enough. Through her time in Amphibia and the following years, she first started gradually getting familiar with the idea that one does not need to be of service to anyone in order to be liked. Instead, people like you, like her, for who she is and what she does. Moving away and finding friends other than Marcy and Sasha helped her understanding she has a right to be liked for who she is as a whole, and that in a friendship she should not need to hold back parts of herself. In contrast, Anne may have never made another friendship as strong as the one with the Plantas, especially with Sprig, and that is partly proved by her job 10 years later. She's working with amphibians now. Before coming to Amphibia, she's never had a real interest in animals and biology. Of course, she's become used to frogs and is no longer disgusted by them, but it's unlikely her interests completely changed from having zero interest in something to wanting to spend her entire life dealing with that topic. So perhaps working with frogs is actually a sign of her still trying to cope with being separated from her best friends. Understandably, having tasted what it's like to have such a great friendship, regular superficial friendships will never be able to fill the void inside her heart. Thus, she's attempting to at least ease the pain a little by placing herself in an environment that reminds her of the greatest time of her life. Next, we are going to place ourselves at the very bottom of the Amphibia Iceberg. What lies buried here are wild theories, controversies and speculations, making this level the most interesting. And what better way to kick this off than with the theory of the afterlife. Right after Anne turned to dust, she woke up in a space-like realm, with countless floating islands and houses on them. Clearly, had her consciousness not been sent back, it would have remained there. Additionally, we have every reason to believe that all the other houses are exactly like Anne's, just for whomever they belong to, meaning that this realm is some kind of afterlife. Possibly an afterlife in the common sense, like a realm where every dead soul ends up spending eternity. By alternative, this may be a calamity gem only club. Whoever carries the power of a gem does indeed have a special bond to the entire multiverse and the Guardian. Only makes sense that this special bond is somewhat of a key, granting people access to this unique afterlife. Going even a step further, the afterlife could also be limited to those who use the secret spell, those who realize the closest connection possible to the Guardian. If we take this idea at face value for a second, the fact that all these houses belong to people who carried calamity power 
powers suggests two more intriguing theories. Did they all use the very same gems? If not, that would directly confirm the existence of other gems. There could very well be identical pairs in other sub-universes. Why shouldn't there be more? Wouldn't make sense for the Guardian to look for a successor in merely a handful of the countless worlds out there. And three tiny gems are hardly enough to cover the entire multiverse. Could this be how Anne and the Plantas get to see each other again? Matt did declare that it's highly likely they got to meet again during their lifetimes. If by chance or fate a new set of fresh gemstones winds up on Earth or Amphibia, re-establishing the connection should pose no problem. Alternatively, even if no new gems ever come to Earth, Terry's portal clearly produced sufficient proof that traveling the worlds is feasible through the power of science alone. The only thing she was lacking in the show was an appropriate source of power. Humanity figuring out how to fix that issue honestly isn't much of a reach. If they all did use the gems from Amphibia, just how many thousands of years have the Guardian been searching for a successor? What are their stories? Could it be that the prophecy is like an ever-repeating cycle? This could simultaneously be an explanation how the Guardian we currently know came into this position and why they really want to pass on the road. Moreover, considering the gems go far, far, far back, they may be the reason why amphibians exist on Earth. Even in real life, scientists are not very sure where amphibians truly came from. They are believed to have evolved separately from the other classes. So what if in the show, some prehistoric amphibians from Amphibia accidentally got transported to Earth because of the gems, where they then evolved differently from their counterparts in Amphibia, as a result of the different living conditions, ensuing the emergence of earthly amphibians. And all that because the Guardian is looking for a successor. Who am I to judge? But, like, did the Guardian properly think this through? Were they sure there was no more appropriate way to find the next Guardian? Because I honestly don't see how the gems are a good test. First of all, in order for the gems to function as a test, in exactly the way they did in Amphibia, there needs to be a villain someone else can play the hero for. Maybe I'm crazy, but I've got this weird feeling super evil hive minds are not all that common. You know what I mean? The Guardian made it seem like only someone who selflessly sacrificed themselves like Anne can be considered eligible at all. Would the Guardian have ignored every common being, maybe even entire civilizations, that treat the gems well without abusing their powers? Is it bad to use them for one's own benefit, even if it's not in any way evil? There has at no point been a guarantee, a scenario, suiting the Guardian's wishes would ever arise. If anything, the creation of the gems artificially led to such a situation. Given only because of the gems, could the core be made reality in the first place. What gives rise to another important question. How much of the Guardian are the Guardian really? Or let me phrase it differently. Are the Guardian bad at their job? Their purpose is to watch over the multiverse. I'm no expert in the Guardian business, but shouldn't Guardians keep the peace? Secure the balance of the world and stuff? Yet the Guardian willingly created a means providing evidently flawed mortals with the power to break the boundaries of the world? What could go wrong? Am I right? How many beings suffered and died because of the gems? What if Anne had not managed to kill the core? How long would the Guardian have kept watching the multiverse being turned upside down? All that just to find someone to relieve them of their duties. Something is not adding up here. And not lastly, because the Guardian can confirmedly see the future. Yeah, that means they should have known all along that Anne would end up becoming Guardian. To what degree do the Guardian have the ability to change the future they know. Being aware that Anne was always supposed to be Guardian, could they have found another way to lead her down that path while avoiding all this suffering? Or is everything written in stone? And in order for the entire multiverse to keep functioning, the events of Amphibia had to play out exactly like they did? We'll never know. What you do know, however, is that you can find loads of interesting anime and cartoon content on Frogtoons. And with every like and sub, you are directly supporting me in creating this content for you. Thanks for sticking around. And if none of us get stuck in another world, I hope we'll see each other again.